let's invite our training panelists to the virtual stage. Mark Parent, the CEO of Commissioners du Quebec, Stéphane Vachonzi, who is a patrol sergeant and public safety unit, unit training sergeant, Michael McKenzie, a field training and academy lieutenant with the Orange County Sheriff's Office in Florida, and Steve Nash, who is a teacher, mentor, and trainer. Over the last few years, police departments have been called on to update the training they provide for their officers. Deciding how to change the training or when to implement the new updates have posed challenges for many agencies. As in our morning discussion, each panelist will have a few minutes to speak, and once we've heard from all four our panelists, we'll open it up to a general discussion with our remaining time. Before we get started, I'll share a brief introduction for each of our panelists. After a successful 31 years with the Service de Police de la Ville de Montreal, including five years as chief, Mark Parent joined Commissioners du Quebec in August, 15, August 2015 as the CEO. He has an in-depth understanding of social and work environments, and he is a driving force in promoting high-performance cultures that leads to an adaptive capacity to act. Stéphane Bachonzi is currently assigned as a patrol sergeant, public safety unit training sergeant and lead coordinator, and public safety unit tactical advisor for a major city police service in the province of Alberta. Stefan has held many different titles during his career, and throughout these assignments, he has taught various disciplines and is currently focusing on instructor development and supervisory training as it relates to crowd management, crowd control, and the public safety unit. Also joining our panel today is Michael McKenzie, who is employed with the Orange County Sheriff's Office in Florida as the field training and academy lieutenant assigned to the training section. Lieutenant McKenzie is also a retired United States Navy Chief Petty Officer, serving both active duty and reserves for 22 years. While on active duty Navy, he was the course manager and lead instructor for the U.S. Navy Military Police Academy, earning his Master Training Specialist designation and Law Enforcement Teaching Certificate. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Steve Nash, who is a full spectrum teacher, mentor, and trainer who has spent the last 35 years engaging with individuals and teams seeking to maximize their awareness, performance, and long-term success. His background experience includes almost 25 years as a military officer and commander, serving at home and abroad in the Royal Canadian Regiment, the Canadian Airborne Regiment, the UK Parachute Regiment, and Canadian Special Forces, Special Operations Forces Command. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And now we'll go on to Stefan Um, So thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, like Brittany said, so I have been in law enforcement for the better part of 20 years. Uh, I have worked um, in the security industry. Uh, I've been a sworn police officer in Alberta uh, for 16 years and I've worked a variety of um, assignments for lack of a better term but uh, a great deal of those assignments have included training of some sort or have included um, largely the realm of crowd management public safety um, and right now my operational job is that of a patrol sergeant in the city where I work which is uh, just over a million people. One of the things that I've seen um, that's pretty uh, striking to me is, I mean, I've heard a lot of people and a lot of members today talk about the challenges and policing and the things that we're going through. Um, but what I have noticed is that at an operational level, uh, the vast majority of our younger membership still wants to train um, and are very motivated in doing so. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but one of the things that I've been able to do in my career, so in 2017, I began working for uh, Canadian Innovative Protective Solutions, so SIPs. Um, that's a company ran by a retired sergeant from the agency I worked in. Um, and I kind of work on a contract basis and I'm currently the specialty training coordinator uh, for that company. And what that company has allowed me to do um, is deliver the, the comprehensive public safety training that the company does. Um, but in the, in the private sector uh, for peace officers, um, so for those that aren't sworn police officers, um, and it gives you a good and different perspective. Um, I've trained defensive and control tactics, uh, vehicle related training, um, and of course, uh, the specialty training that I coordinate right now is largely uh, related to crowd management, crowd awareness. And one of the things I was able to do was to uh, train uh, peace officers for the city where I work, um, and uh, just about all of them actually, on a, on a comprehensive program for crowd awareness. Um, 
from the policing side, uh, as was mentioned, so I worked or I work for a public safety unit where I'm the training lead coordinator and training sergeant. Um, I'm a tactical advisor, so an operational tactical advisor to our commanders. And I've had the ability to work, um, you know, the Ottawa Freedom Convoy, I'm sure as everybody's well aware of, I uh, was deployed there. Um, we've had a great deal of encampments that we've dealt with in the city where I work. <clears throat> uh, and we've had some very, very, very um, good success in dealing with those. Um, and Ottawa was another um, deployment that allowed us to see uh, a multifaceted joint operational approach um, to successfully deal with everything that was happening. Um, so that was very good as well and, and gives you a lot more um, perspective when we deliver our training. One of the things um, that I try and do in my operational role um, as a patrol sergeant is, um, you know, having a lot of executive members here today talk about um, kind of kind of that macro view and and um, from a large uh, a leadership perspective for the agency, I try to focus a lot on the actual squad and the things that we can do and we can um, affect ourselves. Um, I'm lucky to work in an organization where training is taken very seriously. Um, we have a lot of opportunities for training days. We, uh, in the organization I work in, we have two ranges, we have a training campus. Um, however, we still take it upon ourselves in our own group um, to focus on um, the quality of training, not necessarily the quantity of training. And I think that's a big thing these days because what we're seeing is um, a lot of challenges in policing um, you know, use of force was mentioned in the last presentation, which I agree with. That's a, a huge uh, topic of debate right now. Um, and I think if we only rely on the organization to deliver the training that's required, um, I think we're going to shortchange ourselves, and we're going to be disappointed. We have to um, look beyond that. And we have to, um, again, take things that are in our control or within our squad's control and, and build from there. Um, one of the things um, that we talk about quite often in the in the team that I work, um, because we're so committed to training, is um, we end up do tape. We do tabletops. We do um, short sessions um, on what we call our parade. So I know in different agencies it's a pre-work briefing. It could be roll call, um, and it gives us the opportunity to um, take that that short time frame and again focus on that quality. So we've done uh, shooting drills. We've done vehicle stop drills, we, in the agency I work, um, deploying uh, tire deflation devices, we've done training for that. Uh, we brought in guest presenters, so we've brought in investigators uh, from various units, from homicide to firearms uh, units. We've had um, people come in that speak about Indigenous relations. Um, so running the gambit of all sorts of topics um, that keep their interest because it's not the same thing over and over again, uh, but again, focusing on that quality. In the private sector, uh, going back to working for SIPS, I think it gives me an opportunity to experience different perspectives from um, non-police organizations, but obviously they do similar work. And, and working with those people um, and those members and the different stories they have, experiences they have, areas they work. Uh, a lot of the training we do is out in rural areas with some of these uh, organizations through SIPS. Um, again, allows you to be more robust and focus on that, that quality of training um, and, and start to hear, again, uh, different perspectives that they may have. I think, uh, I mean, it's not a lot of time today, but when you talk about the future of training, um, that's a very diverse topic in itself. Um, you know, largely we've had very, very uh, much the same type of use of force type training over the years. Uh, there's been the odd programs that come in, but um, I can definitely speak to the agency I've worked in. We've kind of rotated back to the same systems that we've used for, for decades, uh, to be honest. And that's starting to change. So now what we're starting to see is um, looking to do a lot more research, looking into uh, different methods of control, um, uh, methods that um, might not rely on some of the um, systems uh, that we used prior for a variety of reasons. Um, some of it is perception, some of it is uh, injury, all the things that you talk about when you talk about training. Um, and of course, we still have to balance that, that perception and um, those tactics with the needs of the membership, membership rather out there. And I think in the agency I work in, and I think this is pretty consistent across Canada, uh, we're seeing a great deal of firearms. 
out on the street and the use of firearms by our some of our criminals and of course you know you want to balance and there's always the topic of uh, militarization of police and some of the equipment that's used but having to balance that with um, well, what do we need to protect our membership and because of the firearms and some of the things that we're seeing we have to have that ability um, and I think that that leads into the next um, kind of subtopic but that's when we talk about communication um, are we doing our best to communicate to the public are we doing our best to communicate um, to city council to commissions or police commissions rather to uh, decision makers on why we do what we do um, one of the things that uh, has been a, a very big interest of mine in every element of training that I do is um, the physiological responses and the, what causes us to, to act a certain way, respond a certain way under stress during use of force. And um, those, are, those are based on human responses. Those are not police responses. Um, yes, we use them, but again, there, there's a lot more to that and there's science to that. Um, do we do or are we doing a good job on communicating that and that's something that I know that is a challenge where I work um, it's even a challenge in the private sector uh, the private sector of course gives you a little bit more leeway um, sometimes in that um, you know it, it, you're not guided necessarily by a big organization but um, but the premise is still the same uh, fighting misinformation I mean that's another huge thing that we're seeing especially in use of force and I know in Alberta uh, we have had to face that in both of our major cities um, uh, a significant use of force incident happens and then misinformation is is uh, widely shared on social media platforms and i know um there's been a couple of comments earlier today um, from the recruiting side uh talking about social media and and that is how this uh these younger generations uh, communicate so um, how are we going to deal with that how can we combat that how can we um help when we train our members to understand that uh, and that's I don't have an answer to that, but that's something that is definitely um, looked at and um, is something that we're, we're fighting to, to move forward with. Um, I do think, again, going back to the private sector, it, it allows, um, or it is an easier platform to build bridges and to, to have relationships where, um, with individuals who are, again, not sworn police officers. Um, so you can, you can start to build bridges, work on that communication and I, I think that's that's quite huge. Uh, just quickly, as kind of my last point, uh, so the public safety aspect, um, the, the crowd management, and one of the things, uh, both in the private sector and in the organization that I work, that um, you know, I, it's mentioned, and I, I talked in my bio about development um, for instructors, supervisors. Uh, crowd management is a a very very. Um, or a significant issue right now in that we're seeing um, large protests, um, sometimes unrest. The Ottawa Freedom Convoy is a good example. They have another uh, rolling thunder convoy rolling in this weekend. Um, and we're starting to see it all over. We're seeing encampments uh, from Halifax to Toronto to Ed like Edmonton and places all over the country. Um, how we're dealing with that and, and the training that we're doing, and I can speak for the unit I work in and the organization I work in, is we're trying to get away from the old hats and bats riot team um, persona and onto crowd management. So being proactive, using the science behind crowd movements, crowd psychology, crowd dynamics, um, teaching our instructors from the ground level up, teaching our supervisors, teaching our commanders, ensuring that they are essentially becoming experts in that realm. And that way, when they do their decision making or use their processes um, to deal with these types of issues, uh, we have a much greater chance at success. And in the private sector, the same thing. So when we talk about crowd awareness, the same types of principles are being taught to some of these organizations of peace officers so that it's consistent all the way around and that we're looking for that success without having to um, rely on significant use of force. Now, there's always the chance that, that happens and we train for uh, the worst, worst case scenario rather uh, quite often. However, uh, again, we're trying to be proactive and, and trying to ensure that we're building um, that expertise uh, and that leadership um, from the ground level up inside the teams to be successful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Stefan. Now we're going to hand it over to Michael McKenzie. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, or actually, it's afternoon now. The uh, appreciate once again. I uh, thank uh, Blue Line Expo for inviting us to participate in this discussion group. I think it's very fruitful and informative for us to share our ideas. Um, as Brittany uh, kind of laid out before, I, I have a pretty lengthy background and training, both in the military and the civilian world. 
So some of that passion I brought to the training section when I got assigned here. Um, what I would like to do over the next several minutes is kind of discuss how we as the Orange County Sheriff's Office have approached training, uh, specifically since the pandemic hit, which kind of highlighted some of our weaknesses and some areas that we needed to address to ensure that our personnel were being trained properly um, in light of a lot of circumstances. One of the first things we had to evaluate, evaluate our training um, in response to our, the community concerns after the George Floyd incident, that obviously sparked a lot of concern through the through our country um, internationally, and we moved quickly to implement some de-escalation training and fair and impartial training for all of our sworn law enforcement officers to help try to uh, reevaluate our training methods and make sure that we were getting the message out to our personnel on how we can de-escalate and approach our community properly, especially in light of a lot of the hate that was coming out out of the George Floyd incident and the actions of the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, we do conduct similar training to this, so this wasn't something out of the norm, but we decided to implement that immediately. Um, the timeliness of this really reinforced our community's trust in what our agency's done or doing, and that we didn't necessarily condone the actions of that police department involved in that incident. And that's really what it comes down to is, is, is building and maintaining the community's trust in our practices. I think being transparent to make sure that uh, we're not trying to over or cover up or not tell anyone about what it is that we're doing um, and kind of let them make the decision on their own based on the training we're providing. And I think that's been successful so far. We've had um, as, as they have throughout the country, we've had civil unrest here in our own community. And I think the relationship that our agency has with the community has really minimized the effects of that. And, and it hasn't been as bad as it has in some other parts of the United States. Um, secondly, the pandemic, it really opened our eyes to creating um, innovative ways to get training done. Some of the challenges we had, we had to prioritize how we could deliver our training safely. Um, our training class, our classroom training was canceled, severely reduced to promote social distancing. This obviously impacted our agency's training. Defensive tactics training was incredibly reduced or canceled due to close contacts. So a lot of the unknowns that COVID presented itself um, in the spring of 2019 really posed a lot of challenges of how close we could get to one another and then what social distancing measures we needed to put in place to protect ourselves, especially from contracting the virus as well as spreading it. Um, that pandemic pushed us to use other means to deliver training. We use a virtual system that's called Power DMS. It's basically a, virtually, a virtual system that houses all of our policies and procedures. It also allows us the ability to create training programs and disseminate that through our entire agency in a variety of methods, whether it be a video presentation with a narrative, with narration, or it could be through a PowerPoint presentation to a company with a policy. And some of those have tests to at least validate some competency at the end of that. That's proved very successful for us. We've obviously grown as an agency, um, including more of these type of programs as we've moved along. Our basic recruit and training academy also had interesting challenges. It's FDLE, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, mandated that um, we were trying to find options to make up some of this training. Um, our training section oversees our in-service and our academy training. So it's a little bit unique that we deal with our full-time law enforcement officers, our full-time and part-time civilian employee staff, as well as our academy students who yet have been sworn in as law enforcement officers and they're just attending the first phase of their training. On um, the college that we, that hosts our Criminal Justice Academy uh, shut down with no plans of the academy returning. And that obviously can't happen in our profession. We need to continually hire, recruit, and train new police officers and put them through the training pipeline. And a delay in that process will obviously have a huge impact on our staffing and it ultimately will affect the community that we all serve. Um, so moving forward, I think we've had to find a balance um, using some innovation and tradition to chart the middle of the road. And the decision to bring our fair and impartial training was an example of this. We could 
arguably developed internally some training and argue that we that it may have brought more value, but bringing an outside entity into our agency to teach this not only brought an outside perspective, but it also created some more of the community trust that's so important in what we get done. Um, we are constantly attending outside training from our agency, not just our leadership, but our line personnel. The reason that we go to outside training classes is to bring some of that knowledge, experience, and those relationships that are cultivated outside of here and bring them back into the agency and see where their application is applicable here. And those classes are very important for us to go through. And obviously, now that COVID has started to uh, you know, calm down a little bit, we've been able to send more of our personnel to some of these outside classes. And this is kind of what the importance of our training with our agency is, is not only relying on our internal resources to provide training at a level that's consistent with developing everyone, but we're also providing training from outside sources to help expand the knowledge base of everybody that we have. The worst thing that we can do as an agency and in the training environment is not to provide or allow for a variety of training to have a wider knowledge base that we can employ when we put, go out into the field, we deal with a community. Our deputies at work here should be far more equipped um, than maybe someone in a smaller agency that doesn't have as many resources to deal with different problems within the community. Um, I think we have had, we've had some struggles internally trying to ensure that we have reached out and used the resources that we have available to us to provide us with insight and advice and guidance on what kind of training that we would see beneficial. Uh, within the last eight or nine months, we've started to incorporate the use of um, electronic surveys, asking a variety of questions, seeking feedback on a variety of subjects to get buy-in from our line personnel that they have a say in what kind of training they want to see and what kind of training they want to have implemented here at our agency. And I think what that's done is it's created a little bit of an ownership over the training and not just one person presenting a subject or an idea to a group of people, but the people actually attending these training sessions know that they've had a voice in what the curriculum is and what they would like to see, which gets buy-in. And ultimately when people have buy-in, they tend to pay a little bit more attention and hopefully apply some of those principles as they walk out of here. Um, one of the things I know, my major mentioned this earlier uh, about investing in our deputies. And I know I've been part of the recruiting and background process before my career. One of the things that we are able to use to get our newly hired deputies into our agency is that we have a variety of opportunities. We have a variety of assignments within our agency. So those opportunities itself are encouraging or enticing to someone that might wanna seek employment with our agency. But furthermore, we try to highlight the amount of training that we will do on an annual basis that we will regularly train um, in a variety of subjects, whether it's firearms or defensive tactics, that we have an ongoing and continuing education program here that allows our deputies not only one to, to get better, but to be proficient and ultimately be successful, move up in their career, and hopefully fall into these roles where they're now assuming those leadership positions where they're able to pass that knowledge and experience onto these younger deputies. And that's, I think that's about all my time. That's wonderful. Thank you, Michael. And last but not least, we will hear from Steve Nash. So uh, as per the introduction earlier, I'm not the Steve Nash who plays basketball, but I am the Steve Nash who spent about 25 years in the Canadian military and having had a medical retirement a number of years ago, I've spent a lot of my time since then uh, retooling myself as a trainer and an educator so that I can uh, support other teams to maximize their performance, et cetera. So as you see on here, my little company does the things that you see and I suppose most importantly, what I try to do wherever I go is to add positive effect and to enable individuals and teams to increase their performance in a method that they declare is useful, 
And I suppose if we're really lucky in a way that we can have some sort of validation of movement forward, if that makes sense. So I think I might not have very good answers, but I have a couple of good questions, which is how do you know that you know that you know, and what, so what, and now what? And I think they're directly related to the training aspects that each of the services, each of the individuals is considering. So I do believe, as you see on the slide, likely training is probably number two only to operational activities, the things that you day, do day to day with your services and your organizations out in front of citizens. And yet every day there's competing priorities. And it is these competing priorities that I think grind away the edges of where our training could be better, more successful, more useful, more relevant, uh, according to different validation structures. And there's certainly a, a paradox of what can be shared and what is generally known to be true at certain levels of every organization. Use of force is one of my uh, specialties over the last 35 years. In fact, uh, I taught military unarmed combat for about 25 years. I've taught police uh, law enforcement use of force for more than 20 years. I've done martial arts for more than 40 years. And my first master's degree thesis was on how to train people to win and survive in high stress engagements of violence. But even that idea, it's one of the reasons when I retired, I had to go back to university to get a bachelor and master's of education to understand how we learn, to understand how we transmit information. And for Mark's presentation right at the start, the idea of tacit and explicit learning and how things are transferred is so important because there are some realities of how the human brain and the human body learn that is not common, but there's a lot of mythologies. At the same time, if we were to consider use of force, the paradox of what can be shared and what is generally known to be true, one of the ideas that worries me the most on behalf of not just law enforcement, but citizens in general, is an idea of defunding the police, which would in fact defund training. But then we would have an idea that if we let people train less and gave them less money, somehow they would be better at something we want them to be better at, which to me does not make linear logic sense. And I worry that it's a form of like sociological insanity. So this, to come to training, this idea of why, why are you training? Why are we doing this? Why are we spending money? Why do we have all our officers here? Why, why are we thinking about this or worrying about this for one second? One of the things that's certainly common in some of the training activities I've crossed paths with um, are the idea that, well, sometimes there's training so you can say you did training. It's mandatory, everyone's gotta do it. And one of the best examples of that might be for many services, many force, police forces is shooting. So generally speaking, in Canada, a police officer will generally fire their service weapon in training once a year. Once a year. And yet, we want them to be really good at it. And I might also suggest, and I don't have the exact statistics right now, but I did some research a number of years ago. If you think of the number of officers in Canada, of the tens of thousands of police officers, the numbers that are not current with their service weapon, they are overdue or they have failed testing is probably not less than one in five. But that idea of what can be shared and what is known to be true becomes in because if you actually, if the chief or the training bureau of any organization presses that issue, then none of those officers can go on the street and do their job. And in the province of Ontario, According to uh, OPP and provincial statistics, we can expect one in five to one in four police officers day to day to be getting paid but not coming into work because they are off on some sort of injury, some sort of stress. And I don't discredit any of that, except when it worries me that it's an invisible statistic. So that means your force uh, just about any service, police service or law enforcement service is probably under strength on every shift every day. 
and that is one of the competing priorities for training. Especially since in training, if you do real training, you can get hurt. In fact, because part of my previous roles in special operations were to train some of the world's best operators to go into ultra high stress, ultra violent situations time and time again and try to have them survive and win on behalf of the lawfully elected government of Canada. But there's a high cost that you have to pay up front for skill sets or even baseline ideas. And again, to go back to the previous presenters of how we learn and how we take these things into us. One of the biggest challenges, I think, is the ability to describe bona fide requirements and to be able to say them out loud in the light of day. If we consider high profile cases in Canada, the US, things like the George Floyd case, like that took off and became a worldwide movement. Regardless of what some of the facts might have been and what some of the mythologies and some of the disinformation might have been. And the real challenge for law enforcement in countries like Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and many others, is that we believe in openness and we believe in holding people accountable, which as a citizen, I demand. But there are all kinds of real requirements and real understandings that are not easily shared because they make the public uncomfortable. And certainly in Canada, every police service is overseen by a police services board and by uh, political entities. So if you consider in Ottawa, why the convoy was not dealt with faster, well, because the political impetus was not there because in, uh, in countries like Canada, the politicians, the lawfully elected folks actually tell the police what to do. And the police do their best every day and you more, know more about that better than I do to try and implement difficult things in the real world. And that's why training as the basis for this becomes so important. One of the words I worry the most about is cost effectiveness or efficiency in training. Because to me as a trainer, I know from my previous life in special operations, any corner that you cut in training, you will pay for in operations. So you can either pay up front and not be cost effective, because that just means saving money, and not be efficient, because that means instead of doing 40 hours of training, you do 30 hours of training, but rather to pay the price in the investment. And Michael talked about this a number of times, the investment in your most invaluable resource, which is your people. And I suppose one of the aspects that is most challenging for all of us, whether you're in the general public, in law enforcement, or somewhere in between, is some of the realities of learning. Uh, I'm presently in a doctorate of education program focused on leadership and innovation, but I don't, and I don't know much, but one of the things that is repeated in the neurology, right, how the human brain literally learns, and in the highest and most recent uh, educational research is human beings do not learn when things go well. We do not learn from success. We learn from failure. We learn from complexity. We learn from mistakes and errors. And yet every police service probably represented in this community of practice that we're talking to here is likely told that failure is unacceptable. And I would agree as a citizen, I would like to have failure minimized out in the operational world, on the street, in the community. So that means very purposely, failure needs to be allowed to occur in training. If I consider training use of force or martial arts or shooting or any physical high performance activity, the easiest start point to improve behavior and physical, cognitive, emotional learning is to start from a failure. But if we allow failure to be failure to be failure, then we actually stop the learning and growth process because we're afraid of admitting that we're not, that we didn't get it right. And I suppose the last thing that I'll share uh, besides this thank you on the screen is the idea that, you know, and I got this from a great educator a few years ago is nobody's nerfing. 
you're not nerfic, I'm not nerfic, our systems aren't nerfic, the law is not nerfic, and certainly human to human engagement under high stress, including violence, where people can get hurt or harmed is highly imperfect. So to expect perfection, I don't even believe that practice makes perfect. I don't even believe that perfect practice makes perfect. What I believe is that training and practice can help you be better. And if you're really lucky and if you really try hard and you think about it, you can have relevant training that coincidentally matches the coincidental live events that allows for the best possible outcome. So rather than bore you to tears, I'll close out with a thank you to everyone out there in this community. I used to be part of an apparatus that helped uh, keep Canadians and their families and our allied friends safe. But now I'm just a grandfather and a civilian trying to support people who take on this difficult path. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Steve. Now, uh, I do have some questions for our panelists. The first question is to everyone. Um, it says, over the last few years, we have seen calls from the public to change police control tactics. Can you tell me about the rise in de-escalation tactics? I think we all kind of touched on it a little bit, but if you guys wanted to get into it a little bit more. Yeah, you know what, I'll uh, start, I guess. Um, I think there's this misconception um, from some in the public that de-escalation is something that's uh, almost new and that we haven't really done a, a great deal of in the past. And I can tell you um, from working with uh, the agency I'm in, other agencies, the private sector, de-escalation and the ability to do everything you can before you use force is something that has been around for a long time. And I, I the emphasis has always been there. The thing is that use of force is just more prevalent in, um, in how it's accessible on social media and, and the ability for people to see it. That didn't really happen before. Um, but you know, you talk about training and the more we're able to train, the more confident our people are going to be. And from what I've seen at an operational level, the more confident they are, the less likely they're going to use force, the more likely they're going to use um, their communication and which leads to de-escalation. Um, but, you know, another thing, when you talk about de-escalation, so we have all these less lethal systems now. Um, a lot of agencies, of course, we have the taser um, and different types of tasers. Uh, you have um, impact weapons, um, Arwens or, or things like that. And all of these different steps that are employed if communication doesn't work before we have to um, resort to lethal force. And there's all these, these systems that I don't think the public has a, a, a lot of knowledge on. Um, but these, these types of practices have been going on for some time. So I think that goes back to the communication. Are we communicating the best that we can to the public to allow them to understand what we do and why we do it? I would like to add something on this. Uh, and I think the statement of escalation, or I don't think so. I think that uh, because of what uh, Stephen just said, we need maybe to educate a little bit more uh, the, the population. And uh, yes, it is part of the, the work that we have to do. And very, very often use of force is not something nice. It's not, it's very, it's not the cosmetics. It's not about uh, looking good. And uh, we also have to address that to explain why sometimes use of force is, uh, is a way of, uh, of uh, uh, the way of doing it and using it. It's always based on the minimum use of force as much as we can. And uh, it's the way that our police officer uh, in Canada are trained. But even if you have quite good training compared to other organizations, uh, you always have to explain that. Uh, sometimes when you, you just take a, a little bit of the, uh, I would say the video or the uh, recording of uh, an intervention, maybe it doesn't look good at the end of it, but you need the whole uh, presentation of the, uh, the intervention and the use of force. And I think that uh, public organ uh, organization that uh, were, uh, I, I, Steve said that the uh, instance de surveillance that look at what we do 
uh, I think we're quite transparent about sharing those information. And we know that it's very complex on the street. And this is why you need to always uh, educate and explain what you do. And uh, a big part of it is about communication. But I do not, well, I do not agree with the term escalation. I do not agree with that. I think it's uh, contrary to that. We try to be more uh, with an approach which more uh, inclusive and uh, appropriate. And, and if I could, I'd like to add on, you know, a notion from a trainer, uh, for anyone out there, if you have not been in a tussle with someone who is trying to kill you or smash your head in with a hammer, you may not understand, like, I don't want to be too over the top, but you may not understand the difficulty in engaging even one-on-one -on -one or three officers in one person because a fight, violence is very special to human beings. It's part of our brain. And we might say in our society, because we have a great society, violence is never the answer. I would say it's seldom the answer, but as Tim Larkin you know, wrote in one of his great books, sometimes violence is the only answer. So if I'm gonna defend my grandson and previously my role on behalf of the lawfully elected government of Canada was to defend people with violence from those who could not defend themselves. And this idea, like the full spectrum of use of force always includes communication, always includes officer presence, always suggests to de-escalate as soon as possible, to minimize risk and harm to everyone. But that is a baseline for all Canadian, all American, all sort of uh, related police forces. But it's not the baseline for those who would fight with the police or those who would purposely break the law. And it's, it's, a, it's a skewed part in our brain of how this works. And I would go back to one of my comments from the presentation. If you, the highest order of use of force that we show in media and in movies and in fiction is I can hurt you and you can hurt me. But that is by far not the highest, the highest order of training an application of use of force is no one is hurt. But that is so difficult. And most professional police officers from the very minute they join, they agree that they are probably gonna get hurt while they're trying to make sure the person they're fighting doesn't get hurt. And that is such an important quality. And it goes back to, and you probably talked about this in recruiting, but it's important in training. How do you validate that the person you have brought in in your training is of good character and has good intentions. That doesn't mean things go, won't go wrong, but that means you found the very best person for your service. They are trying to help others, like a mat, but it's hard to validate character and intent. It's easy to validate as a bystander what I saw in seven seconds of video, even if I ignored the previous 35 minutes of video. So that idea of, that's why in training you have to pay up front. So if you only train in 20 hours, don't expect to be good at it. I've, like I said, I've done 40 years of certain training, 25 years, and I would be worried in any confrontation that I was going to get hurt. And I would be worried in any confrontation I was going to hurt someone else. It's totally normal. But in our society, you know, as Mark is talking about and Stefan mentioned, like to share, it's difficult to share ideas of reality because people watch a lot of movies, a lot of X-Men, a lot of Marvel and a lot of YouTube, which might not be telling them some of the realities of the challenges of professional law enforcement. And just on last, I've been, I've been lucky enough in my military service to travel to, I've seen 50 or 60 countries in their police forces. And if you were in Canada, the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, France, if you're in one of those type of nations, trust me, you are you have the luxury of some of the best and most professional police officers on the planet Earth. How do you know? Because when they stop you, they say, excuse me, could I see your license, please? Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, sir. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Awesome. And now I think we'll have just one time for one more question. Um, Michael, I believe it was you who mentioned um, using outside resources for training. Um, for everyone, what new training tools are out there for police agencies to utilize? Uh, I mean, you really got to look at your local and your state level um, agency. And a lot of people have developed 
training within our own communities that provide law enforcement officers with a different view of looking at things. One of the things we recently did as far as leadership focused training is that we've reached out to outside entities. Echelon Front is one that comes to mind where they provide a level of leadership training that can be applied to our employees, both sworn and civilian, and accomplish the goal of developing and creating better leaders within this agency. I think a leadership based focused training has a lot to do with how well our people are trained. If we're focusing on developing our leaders and seeking out training outside of the agency for some of those trainings, it's going to help create a core group of people that will support and endorse the training that's being presented within our agency. So we do a lot of that. We reach out to other law enforcement agencies in the area that host classes. Um, there's a lot of entities within the United States that put on training classes that are very useful, how to respond to critical incidents, how to respond to non-criminal barricades, which is a very hot subject as of late where, you know, we're responding to a lot of mentally ill or people in crisis, and we have to know how to deal with those individuals, not just in the de-escalation concept, but a way to be able to communicate and resolve that situation and seek the treatment and the help that these people need. So we do look for a lot of trainings that are kind of focus around those things, the de-escalation stuff, the non-criminal barricades, people that need our assistance in crisis. And those are the kind of trainings that we're consistently and always putting our people through our crisis intervention trainings. Another one, using our local mental health professionals in the area to come into the agency to train our deputies on how to deal with people in crisis. Um, you don't know how to deal with people in crisis unless you're trained on how to deal with people in crisis. It's one of the tools that we as law enforcement officers tend to overlook, that uh, we look past some of the mental health problems in our community and just assume a person's acting that way maliciously or purposefully um, instead of, hey, maybe this person's in crisis, maybe a different tone or a different dialogue with that individual is going to de-escalate the situation and allow us to get them some of the help and some of the services they need. And, and we as a profession need to get a lot better at that, of identifying that. We don't have resources, in at least in the U.S. anymore, where we had mental health facilities and we had hospitals where these people would be housed. They're now living on the streets. They're living in our community amongst us. Some of these people are homeless. Some of them are homeless, but they do survive, um, you know, living on the fringe of society. However, they are very very much in need of our help and they need us to understand what they're going through so we can provide them with the help that they need. If I may just in uh, 30 seconds to uh, what uh, Michael said, uh, when you also need to uh, to be more, uh, I will say, in the reality in your community, how can you work to do simulating call in the area where you work uh, so uh, you, in this case, you can do major scene exercise, but you're going to go in your schools, in your uh, hospital, places that you might uh, meet in the reality when you answer calls. We do video analysis, uh, case study. It takes process in case study. Uh, and it's very important also to do a lot of debriefing, so feedback about uh, in reality when you do a, a, an emergency call and you have some kind of situation to debrief together as a, as a police officer on the field, feedback is very important to learn from each other. So I think it, it's quite uh, there. It's, uh, you, you only need the leadership to believe in it and give this opportunity to your people to learn. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. I think that's about all the time we have. So I just want to say thank you again to our panelists, Mark Parent, Sergeant Stefan Bachon-Z, uh, Lieutenant Michael McKenzie, and Steve Nash.